Hey, how you doing, my friends? This is Adam Post, publisher of more than a thousand comic books and marketing expert covering the woke shutdown of Marvel Studios because Marvel still does not understand that super fans are not toxic fans. Yes, when 1% of your fans are extremely vocal and they say, hey, we like this, hey, we don't like that, it doesn't make them toxic. It makes them super fans because some people have other priorities in their life and other people don't have other priorities in their lives. They want to focus on certain things. If they happen to want to focus on the stories and the characters you're presenting, listen to them, listen to them. It doesn't matter if it doesn't agree with your own personal politics. Listen to the people who are dedicated to what you are doing that tell stories with iconic characters. Don't ignore those people. Don't call them toxic. Let's get into the story. Before we do, please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications. Give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate you guys. Marvel truly is the classic woke shutdown where they went woke right in the middle of one of their hugest successes in all of the history of the franchise. If you're going to measure success by money, certainly it was the biggest success. If you're going to measure it based on cultural impact, it was their biggest success. And for people who knew nothing about comic books and who didn't understand the history of the stories, they really should have had some reverence and some respect for what came before and spoken to people. You know, there are people in Marvel Comics editorial, Jim Shooter, Jim Salakrup, Danny Fingeroff, and others who knew the history of the company, who knew the history of the characters, who understood how stories built upon stories built upon stories over the course of years and decades and generations built a certain momentum that permitted the existence of the Marvel Universe. If it wasn't for the super fans, there would not be comic book stores. If it wasn't for the comic book stores, there would not have been a Marvel Comics. It wasn't going to continue in the 1970s because it was really no longer viable as a newsstand returnable product. For anyone who doesn't know, comic books that are sold to comic book stores are sold on a non-returnable basis, which means publishers knew how much money they were going to get out of each product, and they were able to sell a lot of extra comics profitably that way, which allowed the rejuvenation of the entire comic book industry, now called the direct market, in the 1980s and then later in the 1990s. But the Marvel people who had piggybacked off the success of the stories developed by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and the rest of the greats at the early Marvel Comics incarnation as New Stan Comics, obviously did not go to the people who know the industry, who know the characters, who know the stories, and talk to them about how to maintain and grow the success. Clearly, at some point, Marvel would need to reboot itself whether it's in comics or whether it's in film or TV, because the stories can't just go on forever. Human beings have physical limitations and stories have physical limitations. There's just so many times you can tell the same story of Peter Parker, the teenage superhero, trying to overcome his tragic past and grow up and become a man. Sure, you need to either restart the stories or what Jim Shooter wanted to do was called a Big Bang back when he was editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, restart the characters with different people getting the powers. There have been takes on that in Marvel Comics since, but the people running Marvel Comics currently and the people running Marvel Studios didn't go back to and have conversations with the people who really understood these characters. And the result of this is a Marvel that as soon as they decided to start pushing their ridiculous woke agenda, pushing Captain Marvel, Brie Larson in the middle of what otherwise was a woke, free, story-driven, successful group of stories told in film format. That was the moment they ruined their momentum and then lost their super fans, who once the super fans tried to correct them and say, hey, look, you're going in the wrong direction. Get back on track. They recast those fans as trolls, as toxic fans. 
as if there was ever such a thing. They had to invent a term called toxic fans for the Star Wars people who didn't like what they were doing to the Star Wars franchise and the comics people who didn't like what they were doing to all of the comic book franchises and characters. Couple of great articles on this coming from Cosmic Book News, Marvel Studios clueless according to an MCU author. What happened to the MCU? Well, here's a great look. The author of the MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios Unauthorized, tells all reveals that Marvel Studios is clueless when it comes to what fans want. This is the book, The Reign of Marvel Studios by Joanna Robinson, Dave Gonzalez, and Gavin Edwards. I've downloaded it. I haven't listened to it yet. It's in my Audible. I will check it out. I'm sure we'll do a lot more stories based on it but it looks like it's pretty well researched. Joanna Robinson writes that Marvel Studios expected Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania to be a big hit. Quote, Marvel Studios is aware of what's happening to their brand. My understanding, having talked to some people, is that Quantumania really shook them. And I'm sure that Scarlet Invasion really shook them further, but Quantumania really shook them because they felt like they had something good, because they all internally thought everyone's gonna love this. <laughs> Which is really amazing because if you would just listen to your super fans, you know, if you had a restaurant and at your restaurant, there were people that they were there in the restaurant consistently ordering a favorite dish. You would say, wow, these, this person really seems to like what it is that we have. Let's make sure that this person continues to come to the restaurant. And again, it's not like it would just be one person. You're talking about Many, many, many people. All they had to do was listen to those people. So once Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania bombed, she says it was when Marvel realized they were not putting out content the fans wanted and realized they were not connecting to the fan base anymore. And then they put it out, it failed, and then they were like, oh no, our internal barometer is not attuned to what people want anymore. With Quantumania, they were like, we put out a banger. And then that's not how a lot of people felt, she said. Matt, the author, would actually argue that Marvel should have known they weren't putting out content fans wanted much earlier than the release of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Yes, at the moment that they decided, you know what, we've got these fans, they seem to be unhappy with what it is that we're doing we really want to push this agenda. We really want female superheroes. We've got to have superheroes of a certain race because that's just so important. But these fans, they don't seem to like what we're doing. We'll just ignore them and call them disparaging names like toxic fans. And somehow that didn't work out for them. Of course, it all started with Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel did make a billion dollars for Marvel, but realistically, that was before they completely diminished the Marvel brand. It was them using up their goodwill with their customer base. It was creating something that was part of a larger Avengers story. They took all the momentum and invested it in Captain Marvel and completely blew up everything they did. Just zero reverence for the comics and the creators that told the stories that got them to the point where they had probably what was a 15 or $20 billion franchise. Marvel was a one of a kind kingmaker incredible studio when it was working. It had a tremendous future ahead of it, but that didn't mean you could do whatever you wanted with it. You still had to serve the basic customer base. iPhone, for example, is an incredible product, but you've got to deliver that iPhone in such a way that iPhone customers are satisfied with it. Just because it's a successful product that Apple has created and Apple is marketing, and Apple owns, it doesn't mean they can do whatever they want to do with the iPhone and they'll never lose those customers. This has happened to brands before. It's not a rule that was invented for the Marvel brand. This is a rule that has existed for all time. Just because you have success, it doesn't mean you can be arrogant about it and that you'll never lose it. Black Widow, Shang-Chi, and Eternals all tanked. From there, Black Widow would bomb but they'd probably chalk it up to COVID because Black Widow did come out during COVID, so Marvel could explain away the failure of Black Widow by it just being COVID-related. Also, Matt, the author, is guessing they may have used COVID as an excuse for both Chang chi and Eternals bombing. However, Sony's Spider-Man was a big hit. A month later, Spider-Man No Way Home came out and would go on to make nearly $2 billion from Sony, not from Marvel. 
And at that point, the COVID excuses started to disappear. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness was disappointing. Following No Way Home, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness got released. However, both Elizabeth Olsen and the director of the first movie, Scott Derrickson, said the sequel was a big mess. It's also known that Benedict Cumberbatch and Doctor Strange were cut from WandaVision with the only reason being because they are white dudes. Multiverse of Madness was also rewritten for the same reason. So you can see they threw going with a quality story out the door in favor of going the diversity route. Multiverse of Madness did not hit a billion dollars. It did bring in a lot of money, but it didn't hit a billion dollars. They weakened it for no reason. Their next blunder, Thor Love and Thunder, became Marvel's next big Failure. The movie is simply atrocious and way too goofy. It's very hard to watch Thor Love and Thunder. You can get into the first 10 minutes of it. If you go past the first 10 minutes, you're not doing it because you like the movie in most cases. It, I, I really had a hard time with that movie. And then after Thor Love and Thunder, they had Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Another huge disappointment. Feige had the bright idea of instead of recasting Black Panther, to pass the mantle onto Shuri, changing Namor into a Mexican and forcing Ironheart into the flick. They had a movie that they promoted as Black Panther Wakanda Forever, as if it was a sequel to Black Panther, rather than what it really was, World of Wakanda, which really didn't fool fans, and almost no one went to go see that movie twice. They destroyed the opportunity to create a movie focused on the Black Panther character that a parent could go see with a child, that could become a cultural event, they took what was a huge success for Black Panther and then destroyed the franchise with this nonsensical sequel. What about the effect of the MCU on Disney Plus? Meanwhile, the Marvel shows were getting released on Disney Plus. No white dudes were allowed though. Again, with WandaVision, fans were left wondering where the Avengers were when their fellow assembler was having a meltdown. Sorry, no dudes allowed. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier introduced Anthony Mackie as the replacement for Chris Evans as Captain America that no one asked for and no one wanted and wants. Don't give it to the white dudes with powers. Of course, that makes no sense. Loki features fan favorites. Loki season one would go on to be the most watched MCU show on Disney+. Plus. Why? Because they just actually delivered what fans wanted in that specific case. Tom Hiddleston is a fan favorite. The series introduced a cool new villain, the next big bad of the MCU. Owen Wilson debuted as Mobius, quickly becoming another fan favorite. Season one was about the multiverse featuring variants of Loki, for the most part, fans loved it. That's all you have to do is focus on the super fans and stop insulting the super fans. Just listen to them, give them what they're asking for, and they will consume your product and then promote it to other people on their social media because they won't shut up. They'll just keep talking about it. If you do something terrible, super fans will talk about it and ruin your product. If you do something great, Super fans will talk about it and make your product successful. You can choose one or the other, but you can't stop them from talking because they actually care about what you're doing. Hawkeye, of course, is a complete joke. Next up would be Hawkeye, which left Jeremy Renner stuck in a Christmas tree while his replacement shot an arrow to shoot him down. That actually happened, and good luck to that series. The author says Moon Knight is good. I haven't seen Moon Knight yet, but I do trust Cosmic Book News. Moon Knight. Oscar Isaac made his way into the MCU in a pretty cool show. The series was original and a unique take on the MCU, but of course we're season two, but they don't seem to be focused on whatever works and doing more of whatever works. That's a big part of publishing. You do a number of things. Some things work, some things don't work. Some things you thought would work, don't work. Some things that you think are gonna work, do kinda work. You just do more of whatever works. It's that simple. Since the release of Captain Marvel, there have only been two cool projects released in two years time, Loki and Moon Knight. And then an epic disaster follows. What would follow would be an epic disaster with Ms. Marvel, the least watched Marvel series on Disney+, Plus and a total failure when they tried to push it on ABC, and the goofy She-Hulk, which brought in the goofy Smart Hulk, the goofy Daredevil, and the goofy Scar. And then a quantum bomb. So there's three years of garbage put out by Marvel, and then Ant-Man and the Quantum Wasp Quantumania gets released, 
which is a complete disaster. The Flick is another goofy-ass MCU project. Modoc is an embarrassing joke. The special effects are a joke. The dialogue is a joke. And the end is a complete joke. And Marvel thought this was going to be a big success? Then came James Gunn and Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Fans did not turn out right away because the Marvel brand had been really severely damaged from Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. Fans were waiting for word of mouth to see if Guardians of the Galaxy 3 was actually any good. James Gunn provided a fun movie, arguably better than Volume 2, and while there is goofiness, fans came to expect that from the Guardians. That was part of the Guardians brand. Secret Invasion came out and Secret Invasion was just plain terrible. Daredevil Born Again needs to be rebooted because Kevin Feige himself watched the first couple of episodes and realized, oh my God, this is actually really terrible. So whose fault is all this over at Marvel Studios and Disney? It's hard to say. It's probably Kevin Feige who seems to be in charge over there. However, who knows how much responsibility Kevin Feige really has we know James Gunn is one of the heads of DC Studios, and James Gunn claims he's the head of a studio he has no one to answer to. Kevin Feige may have people to answer to, or it may just be political over at Disney. What came from the comics should be continued from the comics. What keeps super fans interested should be what they're focused on. I'm not saying they can't have women superheroes, black superheroes, Asian superheroes. They can have whatever kind of superheroes they want to have, over at Marvel, but they need to respect the super fans, not ignore what they have to say and call them toxic fans, because obviously that's what made the whole project successful in the first place. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Always love to see your ideas. Please be sure you are subscribed to the channel. Click the bell for notifications, give me a thumbs up, and I'll see you again soon with another video. And if I don't see you, I will miss you.